Hi everybody, this lecture is about gender and sexuality, which are really two of the most fundamental aspects of what it means to be human, um, and something that we live in our daily lives. Um, this is also um, a couple of, of elements of our identity which are extremely culturally variable, meaning that they um, are different from place to place in the world. Um, and they're also um, historically specific, meaning they change over time. Um, so what gender means in one place is different than what it means in another place, and what it means at one moment in time is different than what it means in another time. Um, so that both makes it um, sort of a fascinating and complex issue to study, uh, and it makes it an especially good topic for cultural anthropology, um, because in cultural anthropology we really are interested in unpacking taken-for-granted concepts and categories um, this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate how something that we tend to just assume to be the way it is or assume to be natural, um, the, that we can look at that in a more nuanced sort of cultural and historical context um, and understand sort of um, how it's produced in per certain places and at certain times. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Let me start with some big overarching ideas that I want to guide our discussion about gender and sexuality, okay? And then we'll get into some more detailed discussion of, of your readings, etc. So these are the take-home points I want to I want to start with. Um, the first is that gender and sexuality are cultural and not natural, okay? Um, one of the ways that we can see that to be the case is that ideologies about gender, that is ideas and practices associated with gender, vary from place to place and shift over time. They are not static, they are not timeless, um, they are not universal. Um, we can say that some uh, sort of gender um, and sexuality sort of um, ideas are universal in the sense that we find them everywhere, but they don't take the same form everywhere, okay? So um, gender and sexuality are cultural. However, and this is a big however, um, there's also a, a tendency for gender and sexuality to be naturalized. That is, the way that we think about those things um, it causes us to take them for granted. They feel natural to us, even as they are culturally constructed. All right. So again, that makes it both an interesting subject for cultural anthropology and a challenge for all of us to sort of think beyond some of the cultural narratives that we receive um, regarding what is natural about who people are, um, who they're attracted to, and what kinds of things they do in their gendered um, and sexual lives. So um, the fact is, in Western society and in many societies, there is this sort of um, tendency to assume sex and gender, and to some sense sexuality, are binaries, right? That there, there are two categories and that somehow that is what the natural world has handed us, um, and that is just sort of the way things are. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk in a little bit about where some of those cultural assumptions of binaries come from, um, but I'm going to start by trying to unpack that idea of sex and gender as being a dichotomy of either male or female, um, and suggest that instead, what we actually see in the world is something that's a lot more variable and a lot more fluid, okay? Um, and your book touches on some of these issues as well, right? The fact that, for example, um, males and females are a lot more similar than different, that in fact there's a lot of overlap in all kinds of capacities, um, and physical functions between both male and female bodies, um, and that, in fact, there's more variation within um, the sexes than between them, all right? Um, a second and, and more um, sort of pointed um, um, idea here is that sex is, in fact, a lot more fluid than we tend to think. It's more of a continuum. Um, and for this, I want to turn to the work of um, a scholar named Anne Fausto Sterling, who's done um, research on intersex people, intersex births. Um, and what she points out is that, in fact, um, not all individuals are born um, readily fitting into the categories of male or female. Um, that, in fact, um, uh, some percentage of births fall into a range that is somewhere in between male and female. The typical medical response to that is to quickly try to intervene 
um, to make a child who is born intersex fit into one or the other category. Um, and she has this uh, sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek um, diagram in one of her publications um, where she points out that, in fact, there is actually a set of standards um, as far as the size and shape of the genitalia of a child that leads to decision making around the sort of surgical intervention that often happens with intersex births. Um, this is shifting some now, right, that more and more parents um, are more open to the idea that surgery is not a necessity for a child born intersex. Um, but the fact of the matter is, and this is Fausto Sterling's point, nature does not hand us two and only two sexes. Nature hands us a continuum. The fact that we perceive there to be a binary there is a cultural phenomenon, not a natural one. Okay, And that's, again, back to this big overarching point that we need to think of these elements of identity as being a cultural construction more than a biological reality. We can also look at this idea of um, binaries or challenge to binaries in the area of gender and gender expression. Um, so again, um, typically in the West, there's an assumption that there are two gender categories, although again, we increasingly have um, many more um, sort of ways of self-presenting than that. Um, and there's increasing um, social space for people to identify in ways that do not fit into um, the two categories of male or masculine or female or feminine. Um, but again, in many societies, there's a longstanding um, acceptance and recognition of more than two gender categories. Um, in the anthropological literature, this is sometime, sometimes referred to as a third gender category, but indeed in some places there's more than three. So that's really just sort of a shorthand. Um, so some of these long-standing third gender categories are, for example, hijras, um, uh, people from India, and fafafine, who are people from Samoa. Um, and in fact, you're watching a film about the fafafine, uh, which is a great film called Paradise Bent, um, where you'll, you'll learn more um, about individuals um, who are fafafine. Um, and this image here is um, an image of hijras from India, um, who are individuals um, typically who are born male, um, but who take on um, this third gender identity of hijra, which is not exactly the same as um, the gender identity of, of being female, um, in that um, hijras often have particular social roles that are unique to them. They often play, for example, very important roles in certain kinds of ritual contexts. And their both self-presentation and other kinds of, of activities are a combination, some male, some female, right? Um, and in fact, there's a, an anthropologist who's written about hijras um, and uh, named Serena Nanda, um, who has written a, a really interesting book. And in fact, the title of the book is Neither Men Nor Women. Um, and she's writing about the hijra. So um, part of her point is this is not just uh, about people fitting into two categories. It's actually about a context in which the gender ideologies make space for more than two, um, more than two categories. Okay. Um, and I linked here to um, an article because I think it's interesting also when we start talking about gender and sexuality um, to, to think about the sort of socio-political context. Um, so in fact, again, the hijra identity and hijra people have been around for a long time, but fairly recently, this is an article from 2014, um, there was also a sort of political and legal shift in India where, in fact, um, the hijra gender identity achieved full legal recognition. Um, so even as some of this is about the just continuity um, across time in um, these sort of culturally variable ways of recognizing gender, um, there's also um, change over that time, right? So um, in fact, these categories and how we think about people do not stay the same. Um, they change um, um, over historical time. Even in contexts where the um, gender ideology um, is binary, right, where there's an understanding that there are two categories um, and only two, there are, um, there's quite a bit of variation cross-culturally in terms of how um, separate 
um, the realms of men and women are. Um, so, in fact, um, in some places, uh, male and female social roles overlap quite a bit. Um, in others, there's a real sense of separation, right? That there are spheres where um, men operate and spheres where women operate. Um, indeed, one version of that is the sort of modern Western notion of public versus private, right? Um, and again, that's changed over time, too. Um, we certainly don't today expect that women um, are only to operate within the private or domestic sphere. Um, and yet we do see that there is still a tendency um, for women to be expected to be better at or to pick up the slack on domestic duties, even when they are also, for example, um, very actively, for example, having a career that is in the public sphere. So that it, just that very notion that there's something that is public and something that there is private um, and that um, there's something gendered about those two domains is, again, um, a very particular sort of cultural elaboration of gender and how it maps onto um, society and the spaces within society. Um, in some um, in some contexts, in some cultural contexts, um, that idea of male versus female spheres, right, in, in societies where there's quite a bit of separation between men and women in their lives, um, you will often find issues around the question of women's sexuality um, and, um, for example, issues of honor and shame tied to controlling women's sexuality. Um, in places where there is more overlap between male and female spheres, there may uh, be more acceptance um, of, for example, things like premarital sex. Um, so again, um, we see a lot of um, intersection between ideologies around gender and around sexuality and some of the power dynamics that, um, that connect those things. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, the um, Western tendency to think about gender as a binary. And this is following up a little bit on some of the stuff that you read for this week. And then I also want to add a little bit more of historical context to it to expand on what, um, what your readings introduced. Um, so again, the key idea here is that it is not just um, uh, a fact or nature um, or something that we can take for granted, this notion that there are um, two genders and that each has its own sort of strengths, its own role, its own space, um, and that there's really, um, there's no sort of context to that, right? Um, so the idea here is to really think about where does that story come from? Can we trace back to why it is that we assume that women will play certain roles and men will play different roles. Um, and if you look again back at the roots of this particularly Western um, binarism around, uh, surrounding gender, you can find some of the things that have led to or contributed to that set of ideas. Um, some of it is um, the sort of myth of universal male dominance. And that's a story that has emerged over time in various forms. Your book talks a bit about it. So, for example, um, the notion of the role of hunting for men, right, um, and the long-standing scholarly approach to hunters and gatherers, um, and the sort of dominance of male hunters in that model, contributed in part to this, this cultural narrative and its power. Um, often, even non-human primates were discussed as um, as as sort of um, representing that same kind of model um, where men are both dominant and the primary providers. Um, so um, that set of stories informed both scholars and um, sort of public or general opinion about these things um, across much of the 20th century. So indeed, as your book points out, um, even scholars working in the 60s and 70s um, were sort of buying into that notion of a universal male dominance. At about that point, more and more scholarship 
um, revealed that, in fact, that was simply not the case. Um, that, for example, um, even in non-human primates, um, not all non-human primates uh, live in male-dominated groups. Um, and that, for example, for hunting and gathering groups of humans, um, hunting is actually not the most important food gathering technique. Um, the gathering that women do, do is the primary source of food. Um, and when there is hunting, it's often not, um, you know, a group of powerful hunters going to take out big game. It's often the hunting of smaller animals. So, um, again, some of these sort of myths that um, have been so powerful in forming these um, these overar overarching ideologies started to be chipped away at as more and more research revealed that the story of how uh, men and women or male and female um, non-human primates interact is much more complex than that. Another piece of this sort of narrative of, um, of uh, again, gender ideology and male-female interactions um, comes from the sort of 1950s cultural model of the family, um, the idea of a male breadwinner and a female um, remaining sort of in the domestic sphere. Um, and that model of that sort of idealized 1950s suburban household ended up being sort of applied as if it were a timeless and accurate um, sort of representation of what families are like or are supposed to be like. Um, and again, both historians and others reflecting back on what life in the 1950s and beyond was actually like, um, you know, came to reveal that, in fact, that it was not the case, um, that, in fact, women have always worked in addition to whatever kinds of duties they take on in domestic spheres. And indeed, the 1950s was not some traditional, quote unquote, form of family living. It was something unusual that after World War II, um, domestic arrangements shifted in response to a number of economic and political developments. Um, this was a new ideology. This was not something timeless. In fact, lots of women were working in the 1940s and were pulled out of their jobs um, and sort of um, through, again, the emergence of this ideology, um, they were they were expected now to stay at home. Um, and this is, again, something that we often have, we've lost that part of the story when we think about those sort of, um, you know, leave it to beaver, Aussie and Harriet images um, of that idealized domestic sphere. Uh, one final point on this sort of idea of the roots of Western binarism is that um, anthropologists have also challenged the notion that um, some of the roles that um, women play in families are inherently limiting to their to them or keep them in the sort of in the home, if you will, um, and that's the notion that pregnancy and child rearing are essentially debilitating to women, um, and and again. It, disallow them from certain kinds of work. Um, but again, the anthropologists working on these kinds of issues have clearly demonstrated that that's not the case. That in fact, in many places in the world, um, women continue to work while um, um, while taking care of children, right? That, um, that children are brought along to work or participate in work. So again, it's really only in places where there's an ideology that, um, that disallows women from doing both, that that comes to be assumed to be necessary um, and a part of what it means to be female. I wanted to touch a little bit now on the um, article that you read by Martin, um, because her work um, feeds into this discussion of gender and sexuality. Um, and she's taking it in a very particular direction by looking at how ideas about gender and sexuality are projected onto our models of human bodies. Um, so this is a sort of anthropology of the body. Um, that is that certain expectations and cultural assumptions um, end up coming out in the way that we model the body and how the body works. So she's saying that even, for example, in supposedly neutral 
scientific representations of something like conception, we see all kinds of cultural assumptions about gender getting kind of smuggled into that, into that narrative. And that's what she's talking about in her article about the egg and the sperm, right? So she's giving us um, sort of, you know, the ways that this moment of conception is described and saying, in fact, this is not at all an accurate representation of what happens in the human body at the moment of conception. Instead, it's a narrative about gender and gender roles in which the egg is represented in stereotypical female or feminine ways, and the sperm are represented in stereotypical male or masculine ways. Um, and it's both, um, because that's what's going on here, it's both inaccurate, that in fact the egg and the sperm don't act that way, and it's just revealing of something else, which is the social context of gender and gender roles. Um, these kinds of issues of sexuality in the body um, are also very much tied to marriage and family. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, that too much right now, because that's what we're going to talk about next week. Um, but for example, your book alluded to the Na people of China, which is a very interesting case um, of people who essentially don't marry, right? And how um, women's sexuality and gender roles are tied to that model of marriage or lack of marriage and family, um, family formations. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so that definitely links in here. But again, we're going to hold off on that. And we'll talk more about Na people next week, along with some other discussions of, um, of issues of marriage and family that relate to, to our subjects that we're talking about right now. I want to talk a little bit more now um, about sexuality in cultural and historical context. Um, and I want to do so by, by taking us back a little bit in time um, and thinking a little bit about particularly medical history um, and how um, especially um, developments in the 19th century um, were important for the emergence of ideas about sexuality and the relationship between gender sexuality and bodies, um, especially um, as projected onto women's bodies. Um, these are developments that, um, again, have a long legacy and continue to be sort of um, part of how we perceive um, women and, again, broader issues of gender and sexuality today. So. Um, what I want to do is just introduce you a little bit to the work of some key scholars, um, medical historians, um, who have worked on this. Um, it's really important work that also informs a lot of the cultural anthropology about gender and sexuality and sort of, again, where those ideologies come from. So I want to talk a little bit about that um, and give you a couple of examples, and then we'll sort of wrap it up with what we've been talking about so far. I'm going to start our discussion of the medical history of the measurement of female bodies with the work of Thomas LeCur, who's a medical historian. Um, and he looked at the history of medical understandings and representations of, of female bodies. And one of the things that he found was that there was a real shift in thinking on these issues in the 19th century. So previous to the 19th century, um, there was what he refers to as a one sex model in which uh, male and female bodies, and in particular male and female reproductive systems, were understood as the same. Um, they were positioned in different ways on the body and they were arranged in a hierarchy. So the female body was understood as a less, less perfect version of the male body, but they were understood as parallel. This is um, demonstrated um, by um, evidence such as the 16th century medical illustrations of the female reproductive system, which um, although they're of a female body, um, clearly look like and seem very similar to um, illustrations of a male body. So um, uh, LeCur's point here is that um, previous to the 19th century, the sense of difference was not as marked 
Um, in the 19th century, he talks about a shift to what he calls a two-sex model, in which the female body came to be understood as fundamentally different from the male body, and indeed disordered. This was both the result of certain scientific discoveries, um, for example, um, discoveries around the role of ovulation and orgasm in procreation. Previous to this era, for example, both male and female orgasm were understood as necessary for conception, but it was also about a societal change. Um, he talks about the 19th century as an era in which male and female spheres um, were understood to be fundamentally separate. So it was both about finding difference in male and female bodies and finding or separating male and female social roles. Um, so uh, Lecure is suggesting that when we look at these um, ways of presenting female bodies, we're also seeing something about social expectations of that era. One real um, clear example of that 19th century representation of female bodies is this um, illness category called hysteria. This was a condition that was widely diagnosed, um, particularly among um, white Western women in that era. And it's a condition that is both about gynecology, neurology, psychology, and character. Um, the idea was that women's, particularly, women's bodies, and particularly their reproductive organs, um, sort of controlled um, who they were. And because those reproductive organs had a tendency to disorder, um, then women also lived sort of disordered lives or had to be managed and controlled. Sometimes that disorder was referred to as a wandering womb. Um, so again, reproductive organs as um, operating in a dysfunctional way. Um, women's bodies were also understood to be fundamentally driven by their ovaries, which were portrayed as sort of the essence of what it meant to be a woman. Um, and so um, various uh, sort of natural or um, elemental aspects of women's bodies were understood as problematic. Um, so this led to the idea that hysteria was sort of an almost a natural outcome. It was understood as an illness, but an illness that um, derived from that inherent dysfunctionality of the female body. Another theorist that we can turn to to try to understand how bodies and particularly the sexuality of bodies was being understood during the 19th century is Michel Foucault. Um, Foucault takes the perspective that sexuality is not an inner drive, it's not some inherent natural biological function, but instead it's, as he says, an especially dense transfer point for relations of power. Um, and he um, looks to, again, some of these 19th century developments to understand where our modern notion of sexuality comes from. Um, so he notes several key developments during that era that, again, still inform what we think sexuality is and how we think it operates. The first is what we've already discussed, which is the hystericization of women's bodies, that women's bodies are perceived as inherently dysfunctional. Uh, the second is during this era, this 18th and 19th century era, um, an increased attention to children's sexuality. Um, so previous to this era, there was not a lot of attention to that, but in this era, um, there's an increased sense that, that children's sexuality needs to be uh, controlled or suppressed, that there's something dangerous about children act acting in sexual ways. Um, this is also an era in which procreative behavior is socialized. That is, um, childbearing and child rearing are captured in social institutions like the family and other kinds of social institutions, um, which it had not been before. And that has, of course, both economic, political, and medical implications. And then finally, this is also an era that sees um, the rise of psychiatry as a field and also psychiatry turning its attention to sexuality, um, including making distinctions between what normal, uh, quote unquote, normal sexuality is versus sexuality that is considered perverse. So during this era, sexuality becomes medicalized. It's something that now experts um, have opinions about um, and um, seek to manage and control. Okay, so to sort of wrap up these various topics that we've talked about today, right, um, including this most um, recent sort of discussion of these historical roots 
um, of some of the things that we've come to assume about gender and sexuality in Western society. Um, so again, what I want you to take home from this, this discussion is that identities rooted in our bodies are not acultural, okay? That means they're not just part of our natural biology that um, were sort of um, uh, left to us um, that, that we have nothing to do with, okay? Um, that in fact, they're part of human culture. Um, and that means both that they vary across cultures and that they shift over historical time. Um, and let me be clear, this doesn't mean that what people feel and know about themselves is not true or is not real. Of course, that's the case. But it does mean that we need to train ourselves to understand how our experiences and perceptions of the world are informed by our social context. All right. So again, this is one of the reasons that I think gender and sexuality is such a great subject for cultural anthropology, um, because it is something that we often tend to perceive as a natural or inherent part of ourselves, but that we can also see is a deeply cultural and historically specific phenomenon. So um, I'll leave it there, um, and I hope you have a great rest of the week.